<laughs> All right, so how was it? I mean, it was short. We were running around, but this place is interesting, right? Did you guys get a chance to talk to some of the makers in the space? Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to start out by saying thank you to Ruben, uh, who I think just stepped out the back. But uh, Ruben bumped into a, a buddy of mine named Patrick, I think. They sat next to each other on a plane flight home. And Patrick went, you have to come here. Yeah? There you are. <laughs> Coincidence. Serendipity. And much of what that place is about is, I heard a friend call it last week, a petri dish of serendipity, right? It is all of these different people from different walks of life, different backgrounds, and different ways of thinking about the world occupying the same space and sharing that knowledge, sharing that information that they have. So the question becomes, what would you want to build, right? If you came here, what would you be interested in building? I started out wanting to build something. I had a, an idea that I had had in mind at the time that I found out about Tech Shop. I had been searching for an answer to a problem for about 10 years. I had come up with a rough idea of what a solution might look like as I was finishing up law school. I spent another six years trying to hone how that solution might work. And then I spent a year and a half trying to build it by myself, facing off with a computer, OK? And I found myself working a lot and not playing very much. And one afternoon, I said, you know, I've done this before. I had previously run investments and had worked 100-hour weeks and not played enough. So one afternoon I went, I need to go play. It's important. And I went into the back and I had a piece of plywood and I took a, a jigsaw and I drew a, a shape on a piece of paper and I laid it down and I cut and I cut and I drew and I drew. And I just went and took that jigsaw and I cut out, out of a piece of plywood, a shape for a skateboard. Now I had never made a skateboard that was this shape before, but I had made a good number of skateboards in my life of this simple plywood variety. And after I shaped it, I drilled some holes. They weren't all in the right place, as you can see. <laughs> And I tried it, and I came back, and I said, well, that, was, that doesn't turn quite how I wanted to, and so I drilled some more holes. And I went, and I skated around, right? And I skated around my neighborhood for about 15 minutes, and I went, that is awesome. I had been avoiding coming to Tech Shop like the plague. This place felt like the biggest distraction in the world for me. I had this very important thing I wanted to create, Coming here would have me doing other things, right? Things like a couple weeks ago, I took a wood lathe class. And I came back the next day, and I had purchased a $2 block of 4x4 four four redwood. And I put it into the thing, and I was thinking, I'm going to make a cup. I think, yeah, maybe I'll make I'm just going to learn how to scrape away wood until it becomes something. And within a few minutes, I realized this, is, this long piece of thing is not going to be a cup. <laughs> but it kind of looks like it could be a baseball bat. And five hours later, you know, I'm new, okay, I'm not very good. Five hours later, I had a baseball bat. Now, it's not a great baseball bat. It's got some undulation, and, but it kind of, it's kind of a baseball bat. Right? The next thing I'm going to build, Jared and I were driving the other day going surfing. You guys got to meet Jared this morning. And I said, ooh, 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 pull over, pull over. This <laughs> was on the side of the road. Now, you might not get as excited about this. But I got excited because I had just taken the wood lathe class, right? And I wanted a salad bowl. I wanted to make a large, beautiful, organic salad bowl. And to do that, you need something like this. Now, this could be terrible wood. I have no idea. I'm a rookie, right? But this is my next thing that I'm going to build at Tech Shop. We talked a little bit about this in the digital design area, so you guys have all gotten a little exposure to it. But my belief is that the difference that makes a difference, the thing that has enabled humans to outcompete every other species on our planet, is our ability to collaborate and coordinate, our ability to build upon one another's contributions, our ability to share knowledge. Other species have the ability to, to share learnings, right? Ants, they leave a little trail. Bees, they do a little dance, right? 
but their abilities are not as refined as ours are. We've had evolutions throughout our history, depending on your belief system, you might challenge what the specifics are there, but certain things came along, like our ability to keep track of faces and reputations, right? Higher forms of language. As those biological changes occurred, we gained a better ability to build upon one another's knowledge, our sensing of the world, our understanding. We've also had technologies that have helped us in that way. Writing, suddenly you can't just tell somebody something, you can share that knowledge over time and at a distance. We've got printing, do that same thing at scale. Radio, instantaneous information. TV, instantaneous information with video, right? The internet. The internet is the primary driver of change in our world today. Anybody disagree about that? Does that seem pretty reasonable, right? Why is it driving change? What has the internet allowed us to do? To share, to build upon and access one another's information. Somebody has an idea, they have an insight, they have a new way of doing something, they're able to put that in front of the whole world. The cost of distributing that knowledge is virtually zero, right? Today's world, you guys are here on an innovation tour of Silicon Valley for the same reason that everybody else comes to Silicon Valley. Because there's some really interesting stuff happening here. There's new models, there's a lot of things coming out of it. The question is why? I think that the reason Silicon Valley is interesting is in part because the internet, to a large extent, came out of here. And some of the early companies that built useful tools, things like search and social media, they also came out of here. If you were, an, if you were a gaming company 20 years ago, you would make a game and then you would ship it. And six months later, you would ship a new game and then six months after that, or a year, or two years, whatever your development cycle was. Today, what does online gaming look like? Are you shipping once a year? No, you ship every day. In fact, you probably ship 100 times a day. Why? Because the cost to ship a new product is basically zero. The cost of testing that and getting feedback is basically zero, right? And I'm sure you've seen this elsewhere here. Oh, it's fast fail and build, test, learn. Well, that's because in this industry, in that industry, in gaming or in search, the ability, the difficulty, the complexity of getting data about what works and doesn't work went to be basically zero as that industry shifted to digital. What did search look like prior to that? Libraries, right? The cost wasn't zero. It was not as easy. The information wasn't connected together. It wasn't synthesized. Those industries, the industries that went digital first, had pressure on them. The first organization that was able to figure out, oh, if we do this, if we organize behavior ourselves in a different way, we can enable the individuals on our team to take risks and experiment and try things. Why? Because they can try tiny things. Tiny things that aren't going to hurt us. To ship a new product in a game world, it's change some code, send see what the result was. Did we lose users? To ship a new product in the jumbo jet world, <laughs> what's going to happen, right? Are you able to ship 100 times a day a new change in the jumbo jet world? Not gonna happen, right? It's complicated, it's millions of dollars, there's lives at risk, right? So the, the pace of, in, the, the, the importance of shipping new things and constantly feeling the environment that, that is going to vary from industry to industry. I don't know which industries you guys are from. My assumption is they are not all online gaming. Okay. You're not here to look at online gaming or Google or Facebook or Twitter or whatever and copy what they're doing. You're looking for patterns. Right? You're looking to see, okay, they got impacted by some of these things. There were opportunities, there were also pressures. And they went through that transition 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Well, as some of these digital fabrication tools, like what we saw next door, come into the world, how are those going to impact my industry? How are those going to reduce the cost of iteration, the cost of testing in my industry? 
If they do reduce that, what does that mean for us? Who is going to win in that industry? Is it going to be the one who executes best once every year? Or executes okay 100 times a day? It's not going to be a binary thing. Each industry is going to fall somewhere along that spectrum, somewhere between really important to execute well and really important to be constantly sensing the environment. There are a couple of things that matter there. One is, how expensive is it to get that feedback? And the other is, how rapidly is the environment around you changing? If your environment is stable, you have a good idea of what it's going to take to deliver quality product. If your environment is not stable, if it's constantly changing, what delivered a quality product and service last year might be completely different from two years from now. And so the knowledge that you are already possessing, that you are trying to execute on, may not be good enough. What's the impact for that? Well, uh, and this is the first time I've given this speech, so my apologies for the notes. Yeah, that's what we're trying for. Um, the impact is where decision making gets made in an organization. At the top, in the middle, at the bottom. Right? How many of you have tried something new in your company over the last five years? Okay. Now somebody has an idea in your company for something to go do. But it's going to take money. How many of you have gone and done tests to see if there's a market demand or do some sort of validation test for that idea? Right? That's useful. Why? You don't want to throw a huge sum of money at something that's not going to pan out. Right? Is that always the right way to do testing and learning? No, you're trying to figure out at that point, should we, is this the right time to scale that concept? But what happens within organizations is that organizations are almost entirely structured to do that filtering, to filter for what they can already prove will work, right? Well, if you can already prove that it will work, you're not out on the edge. You're not going to be the winner of that next phase. So our structures, our organizations are specifically designed to kill new ideas. You guys familiar with this concept? This is not new. Like, the ground has been paved there, okay? Clayton Christensen etc. Disruptive innovation. So market validation is good for scaling decisions, but it kills innovation. The question is, how do you do that? How do you do both? How do you execute well on what it is that you already know while enabling your community, your not only employees, but the people outside of them to sense the environment recognize opportunities, recognize threats, and be able to take action on that basis. The culture here, because we went digital first and it cost us very little, the culture here has shifted to one that focuses primarily on rapid prototyping, failing fast. Right? You guys have heard these terms. Apple being sort of an outlier there. Right? Apple is really good on the execution side. They're really good at the curation side. They're not necessarily doing the Google thing, which is like, hey, we will give our people some freedom and let them go explore, and the good ideas will bubble up. But the bulk of how this community thinks about innovation is that, is the rapid prototyping, failing fast. The question is, how do you, in your company, do that without having the mob steer you into the ditch. The dumbest person in your company train wreck your whole company. It's not by managing to numbers. Right? If, they're, if you're managing people to numbers, they're going to try to deliver on numbers. And numbers are things that you can only be secure about when you already have all the information about what works. Right? So you want to give them some freedom but you want to constrain the amount of risk that they can take on. You want to give them the freedom to go do some stuff, but to do some small stuff. You need to make it so that failing within your organization is not painless, but as little pain, creates as little pain as is necessary. Right? You want to minimize that amount of pain, and your goal is not to find the idea that will make you a billion dollars. That's not your goal. Your goal is not to identify the piece that you can exploit now. 
your goal is to enable people to go and find and learn. Right? The goal is the learning. Don't search, if you're making bets that will impact your balance sheet in a significant way, that's not where you should be doing innovation. Right? That's not where you should be taking risks. Okay? You, the CTO of Autodesk, the guys who made that Tinkercad software we saw today, he describes R&D as risk and determination. Risk, right, the research, the risk side, that's where you want to go and feel, and, and hopefully those are small. Right? And determination, that's the execute. Hey, we found one we think has legs, let's go forward and, and, and put some, some real resources behind that. And that scales up as you gain more knowledge about what the market is willing to pay, what the demand is, what the opportunities are there. Everybody inside of your organization is a sensor. Everybody outside your organization is a sensor. They are feeling the environment. The basis of capitalism and democracy is that concept, right? Like, we do better, we steer better as a group, as a society, when individuals are empowered. That's how the consumption side works. You get to decide which products you want to go buy. That's how the investment side works. You get to decide which companies you want to go invest in. But in order for people to be able to accurately assess which companies might be good to invest in, you have to be able to compare apples to apples. Right? If your investor is looking at one company, they say, we made a million dollars last year. And they look at another company, they say, we made a million dollars last year too. But they're counting that in completely different ways. Your investor community is not going to be able to steer resources very efficiently. So we came up with some rules. You guys are pretty familiar with these rules? Right? Securities regulations, accounting standards, etc. But, and that is to enable that community to do distributed decision making. What's the impact on firms? If that firm is being measured by this stick that measures one thing, profit, shareholder value, on a quarterly basis, what happens to decision making within your firm? There is major pressure for that to be centralized, for that to come from the top and down. And you've seen companies that do it well, right? Usually what they're doing is something different. They are, the management team is willing to withstand the preferences of the investor market right, and demand something that they know is better. How can you steer your organization? How can you allow all of your different people to go and experiment and yet get a consistent and excellent product or service? answers. I mean, you guys know this one already, I'm sure. What's the mechanism that you can rely upon to deliver that consistent service while pushing power down, while empowering everybody in your organization? Culture, right? This is not new. People have been talking about this shit in business books forever. Okay? Simon Sinek talks, talks about start with why. Why is it that you are here? What are the ways that we want our people to show up and behave? How do we take on the world? What is it that we care about? What is it that we are passionate about? When you know your why, when you have your mission clear, and you have your values clear, the people in your organization are able to hold one another to account for behaving in the right ways. Sometimes they will fail. You want them to fail. You want them to take risks. But you want them to take risks for the right reasons. You can manage the way that they behave rather than the results that came about. If, if they take a risk and they fail, the traditional way of managing is you lost money, gone. And so what does everybody in your organization do? They all cower. Oh, I'm not responsible for that. I'm not going to make a decision today. Bill will get back to you, right? Nobody wants to take that risk because they are held to account if it fails. They haven't been given the freedom to do that type of experimentation. Um, so I would encourage you to empower the people within your organization, to give them that safety, to unlock their creativity. Right? What Google does, they have a whole business model around this. Right? They, hire, they don't just give people 20% extra time, because it's really 120% time is how it's referred to here. Okay, it's not 20% time, it's 120, because they still have to do all their work, and then you also get to work on whatever else you want to. Regardless, their whole business model has been built around that. Their, their shareholders expect them to be innovative, they expect their people to have that kind of freedom, et cetera. 
So you guys are not going to become Google. That's not the goal. Right? But you can learn some stuff from them. What do they gain from that freedom? Well, their people have the permission to go and grab someone else and pull them in on a project that they're just interested in, right? that they just want to do. When was the last time that you felt alive? Skiing? Negotiating a deal? Mountaineering? OK. What was it? Cycling the Golden Gate Bridge. When was that? A few days ago. OK. Right. We, how many of you are familiar with the term flow? OK. Are you familiar with, with what flow does? I'll, I'll just super short. Flow is basically that mental state. It's a term used to describe the mental state where you lose yourself. It's ecstasy. Right? You lose yourself in the moment. Lose all track of time, sense of self. You are lost in the task. There are, there's a guy named uh, Stephen Cutler. Cutler, who's, who's releasing a book right now called The Rise of Superman, and he's basically mapping out the 17 triggers for flow. But a few of my favorites are the challenge skills ratio. The challenge that you are taking on is in this place where it's not so easy based on your current skill set that it's boring, and it's not so difficult that it's frustrating. It's right in the middle. Today. In six months time, is that same task going to be right in the middle today? No, because you're going to have gained skills. You're going to be better than you were before. And so your skill set's going to go on over here. And the complexity of that task is still here. In our companies, how good is our boss's boss's boss at figuring out what we are going to be able to enter flow in? about figuring out which task we are going to be super passionate and able to lose ourselves and basically get paid by the job itself for doing the job. They're not going to be very good at that. <laughs> we are good at that because we have constant feedback. We see, I'm getting bored. Maybe I'll try something different now. Right? When you are able to push power down and give people a greater degree of autonomy, they are able to find the tasks that inspire them. They are able to work on the things that, that, are, that they can lose themselves in. So I would urge you, as I mentioned before, if you want exponential results, unlock the creativity of your people. Uh, we talked about consistent product or service coming as a result of culture. I want to talk about what culture is and what it isn't. Culture isn't a mission statement on a website. Culture isn't a constitution. Culture isn't something written in the United Nations Charter of Human Rights. Culture is more important than law. This was one of my first epiphanies during law school. Laws are words. Words do not have inherent meaning. Right? Words are just words, and we interpret them. Each of us interprets them, and sometimes we interpret them in different ways. And that's OK. That's how humans work. We will never get beyond that. Not going to happen. We will never see the world all exactly the same. That's not even the goal. What culture is, what law is, law is there to help us sort of come to some sort of agreement about how we think people should behave. It's something that should influence culture. But the way we actually get results is the culture itself. Whether that culture is the way that the cop on the street enforces that law, or what the judge says when he says, no, officer, you did it wrong. Or when the people go, hey, the cops and the judges and the politicians, they're, they're wrong. They've got it backwards, and they riot, and they burn houses, and they attack the government. If your people aren't willing to stand up and fight for a specific implementation, if they aren't willing to demand that other humans behave in a certain way, you don't get that way of behaving. Right? Culture delivers. The difference between America and Western Europe and places where there is rife corruption is not because they don't have laws that say corruption is wrong. It's because they don't have cultures that enforce a specific kind of behavior. Right? There are cultural differences there. So start with the why, manage the why. You've got to pay attention to the, the numbers, too. If your numbers go totally down the, the drain, you're not going to be around very long. That should probably be part of your why, right? Sustainability is our ability to continue doing this work and thrive. Right? Our ability to, if we, if we wither and die, we didn't do a very good job of creating value and of extracting that value. I want Hannah Arendt was a theorist. Are you familiar with her at all? Philosopher. She wrote a book after World War II, 
um, after Eichmann was uh, tried in Jerusalem. And what she said, and it was very controversial at the time, what she said was, this man is not evil. This is a guy who was basically being blamed for the deaths of you know, a, a substantial, substantial portion of Europe, okay? the deaths of those people. And what she said was, he was an individual, a bureaucrat, operating within a system. And he said, no, I was just you know, filing the papers. That was all I did. I was filing the papers. Somebody else was responsible for that. And she recognized that he was right, that this is actually the danger of bureaucracy, that if we are taking actions within an organization and we become divorced from and refuse to take responsibility, if we are not responsive to the results that come out of that culture, we get the Holocaust. We get 2008. Right? What happened in the banking culture through the 2000s? There were lots of people going, I know this deal is bad. I know this is destructive. It doesn't matter. If I don't take it, somebody else is going to. My firm's going to collapse. So everybody's passing bad stuff. All right. They recognized that they were doing pro something problematic, but they also recognized that they could cash out. And later on, nobody would know. They would still have their dollars. They'd be able to go and spend time on the yacht. Right. If you do not stand up, if the people in your organization do not stand up for what they think is right, you don't get that other thing. Right? All you get is what people are willing to demand. Okay, I will, I will try to make it very brief then. Thank you. At 18, I had grown up moving around the world, realized that the world was broken, but it wasn't broken because we have bad people doing bad things. It was broken because our institutions are not structured in a way that serves us. It was broken because our institutions are structured in ways that serve, they, they serve a specific group of interests in each of those cases, right? We all have problems. If you look at the Soviet Union versus the United States back in the Cold War, the United States and the Western Europe and the, basically the free societies, they outcompeted because they were able to better distribute knowledge and coordinate and collaborate. Okay. If you looked at the Soviet Union, you had centralized planning. They weren't able to leverage all of that information, all of that knowledge. They couldn't take it into account and make use of it. As I was wrapping up law school, I realized that traditionally societies had regulated themselves on the basis of reputation. We do it really well in small groups. But as our populations expanded and our trade expanded, we, did, we interacted with strangers more and more. That reputation system broke down. And the strangers that we interacted with, they had different values than we have. And so we had pluralism. We disagreed about what was appropriate behavior. In light of that complexity, we built new systems, laws, et cetera, right, to formalize how we should behave. We created contracts. We created courts to enforce those contracts. This allowed us to try to get something, but there are problems with that system as well. Coming out of law school, I realized the internet today is already allowing us to share reputation at scale. You look at eBay, you look at credit scores. eBay, everybody in that community agrees that you will send what you said you were going to send, that you will send uh, it right away, that you will pay on time, that you communicate well. And as a result, this very simple star rating system enables not perfect, but very good and very cheap self-regulation of that community. You get good behavior in that community because people can punish bad actors. The problem is, if you want to rely on a system like that for the world as a whole, we will never agree about what is appropriate. We will never agree about who to trust. So, struggling with this for a little while, I finally realized, no, okay, you can change the structure of the internet. You can change that structure so that each individual is able to pull down the information from the sources that they trust, filtered the way they want it filtered, presented the way they want it presented, and covering the attributes that they care about and nothing else. And if you do that, you enable each of us to get access to information that is readable, reliable, and relevant for us. I believe that that will allow us to go to a global society self-regulating itself much more so than the present day. About a year ago, I pulled together a community called Build the Collaborative Internet. Within the last few weeks, Jared and I have, have pivoted that into a larger organization called Collaborative Advantage. Collaborative Advantage is basically a community, 
of change agents, people like yourselves, who are trying to build the vibrant institutions of the future, putting them in touch with one another, putting them in touch with the thought leaders who are doing the work, the, the flow and that kind of research around, hey, what are the underlying principles that might be leading us in, in that direction, as well as the tool builders, the people who can go and give you, can build for you software or processes, cultural processes, that will enable improved flows of knowledge and information across your community. So, in light of our shortness of time, I understand. In light of our shortness of time, I will invite you, if you are interested, to join us. Our website is collaborative-advantage.org. It's literally brand new. It's just a launch page. But we're trying to pull in the most interesting and rebellious institutions on the planet so that they can lead us to a better world. I believe our world is broken, but we can fix it together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.